Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Kim Boge. And I'm Dr. Hoverston. And together with Dr. Leggett, we are the authors of our manuscript in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings titled Upper Gastrointestinal Bleeding, Etiologies and Management. Upper gastrointestinal bleeding is a common medical condition with various etiologies and presentations. It is defined as blood loss originating proximal to the ligament of trites within the esophagus, stomach, or the duodenum. The severity of upper gastrointestinal bleeding is defined by the patient's hemodynamic status and packed red blood cell transfusion requirements. While patients who remain hemodynamically stable may be managed appropriately in the outpatient setting, severe upper gastrointestinal bleeding requires close monitoring in the intensive care unit with early upper endoscopy. The three most common causes of upper GI bleeding are peptic ulcer disease, esophagogastric varices, and erosive esophagitis. Peptic ulcer disease is the most common cause of upper GI bleeding. Ulceration results when mucosal defense mechanisms in the upper gastrointestinal tract are overwhelmed by endogenous and or exogenous factors such as acid or bile. The two most common causes of peptic ulcer disease are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and H. pylori infection both of which may present with gastric and or duodenal ulceration. Esophagogastric variceal bleeding is the second most common cause of upper GI bleeding and should always be considered in patients with a history of cirrhosis with portal hypertension. Approximately half of the patients with cirrhosis uh, that have gastroesophageal varices as a consequence of elevated hepatic venous pressure gradients. However, it is important to consider that approximately 60% of upper GI bleeding case cases in patients with cirrhosis are unrelated to their portal hypertension. The severity of the underlying cirrhosis is directly related to the probability that the patient will have varices. Patients with variceal bleeding may present with melana, hematemesis, or hematochesia, depending on the severity of the bleed. Esophagitis accounts for approximately 10% of, of, of upper GI bleeding cases. Severe gastroesophageal reflux disorder and alcohol abuse are the two most common risk factors for erosive esophagitis that are complicated by bleeding. Other causes of esophagitis associated with bleeding include pill esophagitis and infectious esophagitis. In patients with upper GI bleeding secondary to esophagitis, Hematemesis is more common as a presenting symptom than melana. There are a wide variety of other less common causes of upper gastrointestinal bleeding as well. For example, non-variceal causes of upper GI bleeding in patients with underlying liver disease include gastric antral vascular ectasias and portal hypertensive gastropathy in patients with concomitant portal hypertension. De La Foix's lesions typically occur in the stomach and represent a submucosal artery that has eroded, provoking intermittent and potentially life-threatening bleeding. Mallory Weiss tears are, lar are longitudinal lacerations of the distal esophagus and proximal gastric mucosa that typically present as hematemesis following periods of excessive retching. Esophageal, gastric, and duodenal malignancies can also lead to upper GI bleeding, although these are a relatively rare cause of an acute bleed. Finally, aortoenteric fistulas are a rare yet lethal cause of upper GI bleeding and can occur as a late complication of abdominal aortic surgery or vascular reconstruction, with the duodenum as the most common site of involvement. The initial evaluation of a patient with suspected upper GI bleeding begins with a thorough history and physical exam. The goal of the patient history is really to identify risk factors that, that may point to an underlying etiology of the upper GI bleeding. The physical exam should begin with an assessment of patient appearance and their vital signs, noting any evidence of tachycardia or hypotension. The physical exam should also include a complete abdomen and rectal exam. Patients presenting with upper GI bleeding should be stratified based on all factors in their clinical presentation. Published scoring systems may help guide risk stratification but are not meant to replace clinical judgment or evaluation. Severe upper GI bleeding is defined by evidence of hemodynamic compromise 
requiring packed red blood cells or aggressive volume resuscitation, along with a decrease in hemoglobin level, at least two grams from baseline and or hemoglobin less than eight grams. All hospitalized patients with upper GI bleeding should have two large bore IV catheters in place. Early correction of hemodynamics, hematocrit, and coagulopathy is of the utmost importance uh, and should be performed as this significantly decreases mortality. Blood transfusion should be considered for most patients when the hemoglobin is less than 7 grams, although a higher transfusion threshold may be used for those with unstable coronary artery disease or active ongoing bleeding. Patients with severe upper GI bleeding should also be initiated on high dose IV PPI therapy upon presentation as this reduces the need for endoscopic intervention at the time of endoscopy. A triotide should be administered to patients with acute variceal bleeding as it improves the efficacy of endoscopic therapy in achieving hemostasis, although it does not impact mortality. Administration of antibiotics to patients with cirrhosis presenting with an upper GI bleeding, regardless of the underlying etiology, is associated with improved survival and decreased rebleeding. Antiplatelet agents and anticoagulants should be held in patients with severe upper GI bleeding if deemed to be safe based on their underlying indication of this medication. Patients with upper GI bleeding should undergo an upper endoscopy or EGD as this can both be diagnostic and therapeutic. For most patients, an EGD should be performed within 24 hours of admission after appropriate resuscitation has been performed. However, urgent endoscopy, ideally within 12 hours, should be performed for patients who are at high risk of bleeding or suspected variceal bleeding. Following endoscopic evaluation, patients should be either categorized into low risk of re-bleeding or high risk. Patients who are considered low risk are those that have stable vital signs, normal hemoglobin, and an endoscopic lesion that is not at high risk of re-bleeding. These patients can be transitioned to oral PPI therapy once a day and can be initiated on a regular diet. IV PPI therapy twice daily should be continued for 72 hours after endoscopic management of patients who have an ulcer with active bleeding or high risk stigmata of recent bleeding. These patients can be started on a clear liquid diet after their endoscopic procedure and their diet should be advanced as tolerated. For patients who have refractory bleeding despite a second therapeutic endoscopy, surgery or embolization by interventional radiology may ultimately be required. In patients with peptic ulcer disease secondary to H. pylori infection, H. pylori should be treated and eradication should be confirmed with either a urea breath test or a stool antigen test. In patients with NSAID associated ulcers, NSAIDs should ideally be discontinued if possible. In patients with aspirin associated ulcers, aspirin should be discontinued if used for primary prevention but generally resumed within three to seven days in conjunction with daily PPI if used for secondary prevention. Patrick and I thank you for your time and listening to our video. We hope you find this video helpful. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.